Welcome to the wild world of historical health hacks, where the remedies are so out there, you'll be grateful for modern medicine. From swallowing parasites to sitting in sewers, our ancestors had some, let's say, unique ideas about what constituted a cure. Get ready, as we dive into the most unusual medical practices through history, proving that sometimes, the cure really is worse than the disease. The tapeworm diet, weight loss through parasites. In the quest for the perfect figure, Ooh, people have gone yeah. to extreme lengths. But have you ever considered hosting a parasite party in your intestines as a weight loss strategy? Welcome to the tapeworm diet, a weight loss trend that's as horrifying as it sounds. Back in the day, before keto and intermittent fasting became the rage, some folks decided that ingesting tapeworms was the key to a svelte figure. Yes, tapeworms. Those ribbon-like parasites that can grow up to 30 feet long inside you. The idea was simple. Let the tapeworm set up shop in your guts, where it would happily munch on your meals, allowing you to eat your cake and lose weight too. This diet gained traction in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, with advertisements boasting pills or sanitized tapeworms that promised to help shed those pesky pounds. The logic, if you can call it that, was straightforward. Why bother with exercise or dieting when you could have a parasite do all the hard work? Of course, the side effects were as stomach-churning as the concept itself. Tapeworm infestation could lead to malnutrition, abdominal pain, and a host of other delightful conditions. And getting rid of your parasitic guest wasn't a walk in the park either. Treatments involved ingesting anti-parasitic drugs that could be just as unpleasant as the condition they were meant to cure. The tapeworm diet is a stark reminder of the lengths to which people will go in pursuit of beauty and the perfect body. It also serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of quick fixes and miracle cures. In the end, the only thing guaranteed to lose weight was your health. Sitting in a sewer, the ancient Roman cure for everything. In ancient Rome, a civilization known for its groundbreaking contributions to law, architecture, and the military, there was one area where their innovation was, shall we say, less than fresh. When it came to medical treatments, Romans believed that sitting in the steamy ambiance of a sewer could cure your ailments. Yes, you heard that right. Forget spa days and wellness retreats. For Romans, the ultimate healing experience was a day at the sewers. Imagine the scene. Marcus, you're looking a bit pale. What you need is a good steam. Meet me down at the Cloaca Maxima at dawn. That's right. The Cloaca Maxima, one of the world's earliest sewage systems, was not just a marvel of engineering but also Rome's answer to the health spa. This peculiar practice was based on the belief that the noxious fumes emitted by the sewer had curative properties that could alleviate everything from skin diseases to arthritis. It was the ultimate detox bath, Roman style. Who needs eucalyptus and lavender when you have the aromatic essence of ancient waste? Now you might be thinking, surely they jest. But no, the Romans were deadly serious about their health, even if it meant getting down and dirty in ways that would make a modern sanitation worker blanch. It's a testament to their dedication, or desperation, that they were willing to brave the stench for the sake of wellness. Of course, today's medical experts might have a thing or two to say about the sanitary implications of such treatments. Yet, in a time before antibiotics and modern medicine, Romans were doing their best with what they had. And what they had was a lot of sewage. So next time you're dreading a trip to the doctor, just be thankful that the prescription isn't a day spent lounging in the local sewer. It really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? While the specifics of this practice might not be detailed on your average travel guide to ancient Rome, those interested in the more, shall we say, aromatic aspects of Roman life can dive into historical texts and archaeological findings that shed light on this and other unique Roman customs. Vin Mariani, the cocaine wine tonic. In the late 19th century, there was a beverage that made your morning coffee seem about as exciting as a glass of water. Enter Vin Mariani, a wine that promised not just to lift your spirits, but to literally give you a buzz. Why? Because it was laced with cocaine. Yes, before energy drinks and espresso shots became the go-to pick-me-ups, there was a wine that mixed the sophistication of a Bordeaux with the kick of a street drug. Vin Mariani was the brainchild of Angelo Mariani, a French chemist who looked at a coca leaf and saw untapped potential. His creation was marketed as a medicinal tonic, 
capable of curing a laundry list of ailments, from fatigue to depression to indigestion. It was the Swiss Army knife of beverages, if one of the tools was a stimulant. Celebrities, popes, and even royalty sang the praises of Vin Mariani. It was the Red Bull of the Gilded Age, except instead of giving you wings, it might just make you think you could fly. The ads boasted of its health benefits, conveniently glossing over the fact that it contained a substance that would, in a few decades, become the focus of worldwide prohibition efforts. The popularity of Vin Mariani showed just how blurry the line was between medicine and recreational drugs back then. It's like someone decided that the best way to deal with life's problems was to literally whine about it, with a side of cocaine. In today's world, the idea of a cocaine-infused wine being sold as a health tonic seems absurd. A relic of an era when the side effects of drugs were not fully understood, or perhaps conveniently ignored. But back then, Vin Mariani was the toast of the town, a testament to the strange and often misguided paths the quest for health has taken throughout history. Frog syrup and snail slime. Slimy solutions to sore throats. Long before the days of cough drops and throat lozenges, our ancestors looked to the garden and pond, not the pharmacy, for relief from a sore throat. Yes, in the grand tradition of, if it's weird it must work. People once believed that frog syrup and snail slime were just the ticket for that pesky cough. Imagine, if you will, a medieval apothecary, a sort of ancient CVS, where instead of rows of medicines, you'd find jars of slimy concoctions. Got a sore throat? Here. Have some frog syrup, the apothecary would say, handing over a bottle of something that looked like it was scooped from the bottom of a swamp. Because nothing says get well soon, like ingesting something that hops. And let's not forget the snail slime. Yes, those slow-moving garden dwellers were once considered the secret ingredient to a healthy throat. It's as if someone saw a snail trailing slime across a leaf and thought, that looks healing. The slime was collected, sometimes mixed with other ingredients, and used as a remedy for inflammation. Now, you might be thinking, but did it work? The answer is a resounding maybe. The placebo effect is a powerful thing, after all. Plus, when the alternative is frog syrup, suddenly just dealing with it seems like a viable option. These remedies highlight the creativity or desperation of our ancestors when it came to healthcare. It's a reminder that throughout history, humans have always been searching for ways to feel better, even if it meant turning to the animal kingdom for help. And while modern medicine has thankfully moved on from amphibians and mollusks as cure-alls, it's fascinating to look back at what people once believed to be the height of medical innovation. The smoke enema, blowing smoke up your... In the annals of medical history, where the bizarre meets the desperate, the smoke enema stands out as a particularly airy approach to resuscitation and healing. Yes, there was a time when blowing smoke up someone's rear was considered not just polite, but potentially life-saving. The practice, popular in the 18th century, was based on a rather optimistic belief that smoke could revive drowning victims. Imagine the scene, a well-meaning bystander by the river, bellows in hand, ready to administer a literal puff of life. It's as if someone said, this man needs air but let's make it interesting. The apparatus for this procedure was as elaborate as the concept was misguided. A tube, a bellows, and a source of smoke, usually from burning tobacco, were the tools of the trade. The procedure was simple. Insert the tube, pump the bellows, and voila. The healing power of smoke was delivered directly where the sun doesn't shine. This practice wasn't limited to cases of drowning. Oh no, the smoke enema was touted as a cure-all from constipation to headaches, because when you have a bellows and a dream, why limit yourself? It's the medical equivalent of using a hammer and seeing every problem as a nail, or in this case, seeing every ailment as a lack of smoke. The smoke enema's popularity waned as medical science advanced, and people started questioning the wisdom of introducing smoke into the body. It turns out, the benefits were, to put it mildly, smoke and mirrors. The practice faded into obscurity, leaving behind a legacy that's more cautionary tale than medical marvel. So, the next time you hear someone say, they're just blowing smoke, remember the smoke enema and be thankful for the progress we've made. After all, there are better ways to breathe life into someone, and most of them don't involve a bellows. The vibrator. From medical device to, well, you know. 
In the long history of human inventions, few creations have journeyed as far from their original purpose as the vibrator. Yes, that's right. The device now synonymous with sexual pleasure began its life as a serious medical instrument. Welcome to the 19th century, where doctors diagnosed women with hysteria, a condition believed to be caused by a plethora of ailments from irritability to, well, a lack of orgasms. Enter Dr. Joseph Mortimer, Granville, the unwitting godfather of the modern vibrator. Granville, a respectable English physician, invented the electromechanical vibrator, not for the boudoir, but the doctor's office. His intention? To treat muscle aches, of course. It's as if he accidentally took a wrong turn on the road to medical innovation and ended up at a pleasure party. The treatment for hysteria was as straightforward as it was time-consuming. Doctors manually stimulated their female patients to hysterical paroxysm, a clinical term for what we now understand as an orgasm. Imagine going to medical school for years, only to find your days filled with bringing women to climax. Granville's invention was a godsend to doctors with tired hands everywhere. The electromechanical vibrator made the process efficient, professional, and most importantly, devoid of any improper implications. It was the Victorian era after all, where even the legs of tables were considered too risque to be left uncovered. The vibrator's transition from medical device to personal pleasure aid was slow, but inevitable. As the 20th century dawned and societal attitudes towards sex began to shift, the vibrator emerged from the shadows of medical cabinets into the bedrooms of the curious and wow. liberated. By the 1960s and 70s, the sexual revolution had fully embraced the vibrator as a symbol of female empowerment and sexual liberation. What was once a clinical tool for treating a dubious illness had become a staple of sexual wellness and exploration. It's as if a stethoscope suddenly became a fashion accessory. Today, the vibrator stands as a testament to human ingenuity, adaptability, and our endless quest for pleasure. From its clinical origins to its modern-day status as a beacon of sexual freedom, its journey is a reminder that sometimes, the most unexpected paths lead to the most delightful destinations. So, the next time you switch on that little buzzing device, spare a thought for Dr. Granville and his medical marvel. Little did he know, his invention would one day become the source of countless pleasures, far beyond anything he could have imagined in his wildest, most hysterical wow. dreams. Arsenic complexion, wafers, deadly beauty. In the quest for eternal youth and beauty, history has seen its fair share of bizarre practices, but few can top the Victorian era's flirtation with arsenic complexion wafers. Yes, you read that right. At a time when pale skin was all the rage, signaling wealth and a refined lifestyle untouched by manual labor under the sun, some decided that ingesting poison was a small price to pay for beauty. Enter the arsenic wafer, a product marketed with the promise of giving its users the coveted porcelain skin of a wealthy aristocrat. These wafers were consumed like candy, except instead of a sugar rush, they offered a toxic boost to one's complexion. It's as if someone decided that if living dangerously made you look good, then bring on the danger. The logic, if one dares to call it that, was simple. Arsenic, known for its ability to cause paleness by reducing red blood cells, could give users that ghostly aristocratic pallor without the inconvenience of wearing lead-based makeup or avoiding sunlight like a vampire. It was the ultimate inside-out approach to skincare, predating modern detoxes by centuries. Only instead of cleansing your body, you were slowly poisoning it. Manufacturers of these wafers played down the whole arsenic is a deadly poison angle, focusing instead on the miraculous results. Advertisements boasted of wafers that could clear complexions, remove freckles, and give the user a glow that only comes from being slightly toxic. It's as if they believed the real secret to beauty was not clean eating or hydration, but a steady diet of poison. Of course, the side effects were as unpleasant as you might imagine. Long-term arsenic ingestion can lead to a host of health problems, including stomach pain, nausea, convulsions, and even death. But hey, at least you'd die looking fabulous, right? As the dangers of arsenic became impossible to ignore, the popularity of these complexion wafers waned. Society slowly turned to less lethal methods of achieving beauty though the quest for the perfect complexion remained as fervent as ever. 
It's a reminder that while trends come and go, the desire to look our best, even at great risk, remains a constant throughout history. So, the next time you're contemplating a new beauty routine, remember the arsenic complexion wafers. Maybe stick to the skincare aisle in your local store, where the most dangerous thing you're likely to encounter is the price tag. The cigarette prescription? Smoke your way to health. Yes, there was an era when lighting up a cigarette was not just a social activity, but a doctor-recommended way to boost your health. Welcome to the curious case of the cigarette prescription, where take two and call me in the morning could very well mean lighting up a Marlboro. In the early 20th century, cigarettes were the apple a day of the medical world. Suffering from asthma, have a smoke, digestive issues, puff away, anxiety, you guessed it, cigarettes to the rescue. It was as if the entire medical community collectively decided that if breathing was good, breathing in tobacco smoke was better. Advertisements from the era presented cigarettes as the panacea for a wide array of ailments. With dashing doctors and nurses gracing the ads, the message was clear. Smoking wasn't just safe, it was beneficial. It's like someone saw a fire and thought, you know what this needs? More oxygen. The logic, if we dare call it that, behind prescribing cigarettes for asthma is particularly baffling today. The idea was that the smoke could somehow open up the airways, providing relief to sufferers. It's akin to suggesting that if you're having trouble sleeping, you should try drinking a few cups of coffee. The cure seems not just counterintuitive, but counterproductive. Of course, this medical advice didn't age well. As research began to reveal the extensive list of health issues caused by smoking, including lung cancer, heart disease, and stroke, the cigarette prescription quickly fell out of favor. The once common practice of lighting up for your health became one of history's most glaring medical missteps. Today, the very notion of prescribing cigarettes for health benefits seems absurd, a stark reminder of how far we've come in understanding the impacts of smoking. It's a testament to the progress of medical science, which, like a smoker trying to quit, occasionally stumbles, but ultimately moves forward. Mellified Man, the human mummy confection. In the annals of Did They Really Eat That? Historical medical practices, the mellified man stands out as a testament to the lengths humans will go for health, even if it means turning to remedies that sound like they're straight out of a horror cookbook. This particular delicacy, a concoction so bizarre it makes you wonder about the culinary sanity of our ancestors, involves none other than a human mummy made entirely of honey. Yes, you heard that right. The mellified man was an actual medical remedy, purportedly practiced in ancient Arabia where elderly men, in the ultimate act of altruism, would volunteer to be turned into human candy. The process was simple, yet macabre. Forgo all food except honey until their demise, after which their bodies would be bathed in and filled with honey, creating a mummified confection. After a century or so of marination, the honey-infused mummy would then be used as a medicine, with pieces of the candied corpse doled out to treat a variety of ailments, it's as if someone looked at a jar of honey and thought, you know what this needs? More people. The idea behind the mellified man was that honey, known for its preservative and antibacterial properties, could imbue the mummified remains with healing powers. It's a concept that takes, you are what you eat, to a whole new, slightly terrifying level. The remedy was said to be particularly effective for treating broken bones and wounds, which makes you wonder about the trial and error process that led to this discovery. Broken leg? Have a nibble of Uncle Ahmed. He's been soaking in honey for a hundred years. While the existence of the mellified man is shrouded in the mists of myth and legend, with no concrete evidence to confirm its practice, the very idea speaks volumes about the human quest for health and longevity. It's a reminder that when it comes to medical treatments, our ancestors were not afraid to think outside the box even if that box was a coffin filled with honey. Animal magnetism, the invisible force of healing. In the late 18th century, a new force was discovered, one that promised to revolutionize medicine. No, it wasn't electricity, and it definitely wasn't gravity. It was something far more magnetic. Enter Franz Mesmer, the man who believed he had unlocked the secrets of the universe with animal magnetism, also known as mesmerism. He woke up one day and thought, you know what the world needs? More invisible forces. 
Mesmer proposed that an invisible natural force, possessed by all living things, humans, animals, and vegetables alike, could be manipulated to heal illnesses. Picture it. A world where getting better could be as simple as aligning your invisible animal magnets. The practice of mesmerism involved the mesmerist, the healer, directing fluids in the patient's body by making passes with their hands or using magnets. It was believed that by doing so, the natural balance and flow of these fluids could be restored, curing the patient of their ailments. It's as if someone decided that the best way to deal with a cold was to become a human compass. Mesmer's methods became wildly popular, with mesmerism sessions attracting crowds eager to witness or experience the supposed healing powers. It was the 18th century equivalent of a viral trend, complete with its own version of influencers and skeptics. Imagine going to a party and instead of small talk, you get someone waving their hands around you, claiming to fix your indigestion. Despite its popularity, the scientific community was less than convinced. Investigations led by none other than Benjamin Franklin concluded that mesmerism's effects were due to imagination rather than any manipulation of a magnetic fluid. Yet, the legacy of mesmerism lives on, not in the medical field, but in the word mesmerize, a tribute to Mesmer's ability to captivate and influence, if not actually heal. So, the next time you find yourself mesmerized by something, remember Franz Mesmer, the man who tried to heal the world with nothing but his hands and a hefty dose of animal magnetism.